GPI Global Process Innovations gives company boards, CEOs and indeed senior management an independent insight into the quality of the inner workings of their organisation. Now, a health check discovers areas of strength and weakness in business functions by using a unique best practice framework. GPI's 9P approach also gives boards and their executives the means to set and review prioritised targets to ensure organisational objectives and resilience are achieved. Well, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined in the studio by Deborah Mendes and Larry Jones, both of whom are directors at Global Process Innovations. They're going to be talking us through the process. It's a very good day to both of you. Deborah, I'd like to start with you first. I mean, business transformation, one of those expressions which probably sounds very straightforward, but deceptive because there's a lot behind the phrase. Is that correct? Yes, it is, yes. Um, the term business transformation, uh, it implies, as, as it, the name says, a wholesale change, uh, often an innovative change, to the purpose of an organisation or the means by which that purpose is delivered. Uh, there can be several motivations for it. Uh, they may be due to the ambition of the leadership, who want to change for, you know, for example, to gain a, a greater market share um, or, you know, to, to take um, advantage of a particular technology that, so they may have ambitions. Or it may be driven by external or internal uh, influences such as the need to cut costs or the need to um, actually embrace a new technology. So there are, there are different motivations, but they can be the, the impetus for a transformation. Now, the thing with a transformation is that it should always be led from the top, and it should also be um, joined up across the organisation. So not only um, the, the process, the technology, and the um, people initiatives should all be joined up and also in line with the purpose, the vision, and the strategy of the organisation. Right, so you're quite multi-purpose then, aren't you? Well, <laughs> we aim to be. <laughs> but Larry, let me put, put the next question to you because we, we know what the current business landscape is like. So in light of that, the challenges, globalisation, etc. Why is business transformation so crucial at this moment in time? Okay, well, business transformation is nothing new. Businesses have been doing it since the invention of business, really. Right? Um, an example is, for example, uh, Ford introduced the production line, which completely transformed the car industry. Uh, previous to that, um, cars were made handmade by individuals, and then he introduced the production line, which sped up the whole process, improved productivity, and he made a fortune. And it took several years. The reason why he made a fortune was because it took several years for other car companies to catch up, and consequently, in that gap, that's where he, he made his money and built a huge company. Both internal and external factors can, can affect a, a business transformation. Examples of internal factors are the desire for a company to reduce costs, um, the desire to introduce a new product, um, wanting to incorporate new technology such as AI or robotics in order to improve productivity. And some things may be external, so um, for example regulation might affect the company in a big way. Um, competition. Uh, if a competition is implemented, a new technology has got the jump on you, you're now in catch-up mode, then that means that you've, you've got to do a transformation as well to catch up. Um, and innovative business models. If somebody adopts an innovative business model, which may uh, light a bomb underneath your, your business. So, for example, Airbnb has lit a bomb under the, under the hotel business. Um, Uber has lit a bomb under the taxi business, you know, and that's all very well, but in the modern world, right, the complexity of business and business activities um, and the capability and the speed of new technology, right, means that the urgency and the criticality of you adopting, to the, you adopting these new things becomes much more important. And even competitors are trying to disrupt existing industries. For the, big, the big example here is Amazon. Amazon has exploded the whole retail business. Right? It started off by being uh, um, just a bookshop. It was known as a bookshop. But now it sells everything, including for, for, from books to food. Okay? 
And the whole retail industry is affected by it, right? You no longer do you go to, uh, you no longer go to a, um, a department store to buy your white goods, for example. You, people buy them online. They don't do that anymore. And those companies who didn't adapt are struggling. Or they need to transform their business in order to make going to a, going to a department store an attractive proposition rather than just going there to buy things, which is what they used to be before. They're now exciting places to go to. And that's all part of the business transformation that they've had to go through in order to compete with the companies like Amazon. Mm. And let's stay with the concept of business transformation because where does or how does organisational health fit into that? Okay, organisational health is essentially two things. First of all, the vision, the strategy and the infrastructure of an organisation are completely aligned. And all activities within the organization are executed excellently and consistently employ best practice. And what that does, it enables an organization to adapt or innovate in response to these external factors that we talked about earlier. Business transformation is essentially a strategic initiative, initiated and driven by the leadership and in the context of a healthy organization it makes it a much easier thing to do okay so global process innovations aim is to make the health of the organization visible to that leadership in order to help transformation programs deliver successfully another way of looking at it is that an organization which has shortcomings in its organizational health will find it much more difficult to implement a business transformation program. In fact, 70 to 80 percent of business transformation programs don't deliver their, all their intended outcomes. More than that, even if you're not doing a business transformation program, your company can be vulnerable if it's not healthy. Unforeseen circumstances can take place which on the surface have nothing to do with your business. So for example, if a company's supplier does something untoward, that can reflect back onto your business. And if your process for handling suppliers isn't robust enough, isn't best practice, then you're vulnerable to that exposure. If you are doing it, if you're managing your suppliers really well, then the likelihood of you getting forewarning of something like that happening and having a system whereby you can handle it becomes easy to do. That's just, that's just an example. And the reason for that is that social media and the availability of information and the network of information makes it even a trivial thing um, become something huge. I mean, you've only got to look at the news over the last week or two some things have happened which have had major repercussions on huge organizations which threatens their very existence and undermines their credibility their whole credibility um, in fact McKinsey who does, who does a lot of business research has shown that healthy companies almost invariably outperform their peers tell us about the history of organizational health because it's obviously quite important to the way that GPI operates. Okay, so where we came from, we um, originally worked uh, with IT departments and organizations uh, using a particular model um, for improving the way software development projects delivered and the success of those projects. So again, using best practice in that field, um, we advised, we, we would uh, assess and advise organisations so to bring their practices up to speed so that they were trying to use best practice. And therefore, the implication is they would improve their success rate for IT projects. Now, um, we were very successful at that and, and the organisations we worked with did actually deliver to those standards and were certified as being so. Um, the issue we had, we had a little few misgivings because we found that actually 
the eventual outcomes that they were delivering weren't as we would have expected or as the organisations would have expected. And we felt that um, actually it was often because, not because that department or that organisation was behaving incorrectly or doing anything wrong, it was often due to bigger problems elsewhere. So particularly within a larger organisation, there could have been other issues. Um, for example, the organisational practices overall were inadequate or the, there were communication problems or they may have outsourced something and not catered for that uh, in terms of the, the demarcation lines, all sorts of other um, angles. So we identified the fact that you can't really improve an organisation by just treating one area. You have to look uh, at the whole picture. You have to have a holistic view of, of the whole organisation and, and get everyone up to the same level. So there's no point in having a beacon here and everyone else is down here because you're only ever going to be as good as your weakest link. So the idea we felt was to, to work on the whole organisation. So we did a bit of a business transformation on ourselves and, and decided to operate at a higher level so that we could deal with the whole organisation rather than just pockets of it. Um, and we also felt that actually the model we were using and the principles behind it were sound. There was nothing wrong with them and could be equally applicable to the organisation as a whole with some added bits. So we researched and used other frameworks, business and IT frameworks and models, and incorporated those practices. Uh, I also became um, an assessor in the business excellence model and realised that actually a lot of the frameworks and models focus on the management of change and the introduction of change um, without as much emphasis on the outcomes, which I think is really important in, in any journey, and particularly in business transformation. It should be about the outcome more than the change. So um, obviously the change is important to get you to the outcome, but but it is really about the outcomes. So we incorporated that a bit more into, into our, the way we worked. Um, and then I subsequently did um, the FT non-executive director course and started to look at boards or how boards worked. Um, having gone on to uh, a couple of boards myself, charity uh, boards and, and uh, as a director there, I realised that, um, that often boards, they only meet four to six times a year. So they really don't have that luxury of time and they have to focus in on what's important. So they tend to, to hone in on those elements that are most critical and that primarily that tends to be things like finance or risk, you know, those business areas or functional areas. Um, and there isn't a great deal of time to think about the organisation as a whole. So the picture was beginning to form, you know, we're getting not only within uh, management level but also at board level, there isn't that drive and that um, fluidity through the organisation. So again, looking at that whole thing, we decided that we would develop a more holistic approach and one that would actually drive change from the top right the way to the bottom. And, and the other issue we noticed was, was with boards is that often there's a disconnect between what the board is seeing and what executives uh, are doing and what the employees are doing. So there isn't that through flow of data, um, which inevitably means that there's a, there's a disconnect with the metrics and the information that gets passed back mm, and forth. So you have to put them all together. Yeah, because you want the messages from the board and the leadership to go down to the whole organisation so that people know what they're trying to do. And also you want the information and the feedback to come back up to the board so, so that they know what's going on. Two-way track and flow, basically. Exactly. And, and I think that there is this disconnect. So we then tried to develop uh, a, an approach that would encompass all of that mm. uh, into a framework and, and uh, a, a, w a means of developing the, the whole idea of organisational health was, was born from that. So we've been talking about organisational health and in my introduction I refer to the 9P approach. So how does that follow on from organisational health and more to the point, how innovative is it? This is a question for both of you. Okay. So the 9P approach comprises four elements. There's the 9P framework, 
uh, which I started to mention earlier on. There's the dashboard, uh, which many organisations have, but it's a slightly different take on, on that. Um, there's the Global Process Innovations Health Check. And then finally, and most probably most <laughs> importantly, is the implied active involvement of leadership in the whole approach. So if I take each of those in turn, um, the 9P framework, uh, I, alluded, I alluded to it earlier, it comprises a set of best practice activities and actions that, are, that pertain to a whole organisation. So it's a holistic set of best practices. And what we've done is we've organised that uh, into nine different business uh, and functional facets uh, called the 9Ps. Um, and we call it the 9Ps for ease of use and, and to remember them. Um, so we have that as the framework. We then use that framework to help an organisation either develop a new one or rework an existing dashboard to enable it to consider all aspects of business um, practice, best practice, rather than, as I was saying to you about many boards, just focusing on one or two aspects, we give them the ability to consider the whole range of, of uh, assets, of facets, okay. sorry. Look at the dashboard, not only from that holistic point of view, but also in terms of criticality. So it's kind of a matrix that we take them through. Um, we look at which, what, which is what most boards actually focus on, the most critical angle. So what are the things that enable this organisation to keep going, to keep this light switched on, um, to help them remain a going concern? We then also look at um, the strategy that they've come up with. What do they need to look at in terms of making that strategy real and deliver on it? And then finally, which is what most boards probably don't keep an eye on but should, the long-term organisational health. Okay, so, so that's the approach we take to enable uh, the leadership team come up with a dashboard that is holistic and that actually deals with each of those aspects. So for example, with, with the critical factors, most organisations will look at the financials, they'll look at what risks will, there, will come up to, to bite them. They don't necessarily consider other things and, and it may be critical if you're in retail to look at customer satisfaction or if you are in an industry where your employees are hard to find, look at employee satisfaction. So these might be critical factors that they really should be considering and if anything goes awry, you need to deal with it straight away. With the strategy, you've got a bit more time on your hands so if you find that things are going wrong, you've got a bit more time to address it but you still need to not only think about the strategy that you've defined and all the metrics that go with it to monitor it, but there may be other angles and we come back to the nine Ps. So what are, what are the aspects that you need to consider that will actually uh, enable your strategy to take place? And again, not all organisations think of all of the different factors. You know, what are the processes? What are the, who are the people that we need to engage to make this strategy happen? Um, what kind of performance are we looking for? So there's different elements that an organisation should be looking at, even in those very basic functions. Yeah. With that dashboard, the, we use the dashboard to enable the leadership, whether it be the board or senior management, to drive down through the organisation all of the elements and all of the goals that they now want to see. So rather than just being a high level goal, we have got a series of goals that they can tell the organisation that this is what we want to, to drive down through the organisation to get results on that we're going to monitor. And because the board meet regularly, they use that dashboard to monitor change and improvement uh, as things go on. Um, the feedback into, back into the dashboard is um, derived from KPIs and metrics from the organisation feeding back in and also so that's the third element is how the leadership is actively involved in monitoring and then the fourth element which is the the global process innovations health check that can be used to apply the 9p framework to the organisation 
So we look at different uh, parts of the organisation. We can interrogate them, we work with them to get their feedback. And we can then, therefore, using um, a series of questions and a series of, of um, insights, we ask the organisation how it behaves in response to each of the practices that are identified in the 9P framework. And so that provides another element of feedback into the dashboard because we can help them identify where the strengths and weaknesses lie and therefore they know how healthy the organisation is. So it's, it's encouraging businesses to actually change the way they think to a certain extent exactly. as well. And, and, and Larry, how innovative an approach would you say that is? Um, well, it's, it incorporates all the models that we investigated um, into a very simple model. And it make, it, the fact there's nine Ps makes it very understandable. I mean, underneath, the, don't get it really wrong, underneath the nine Ps is a huge infrastructure of questions and interrogations of the organisation that we can make in order to, in order to gain a, a good picture of the organisational health and identify those things where the, uh, the organisation might be falling short um, in, order that we can, in order that they can see which of those things are threatening their immediate, their critical factors, right? So, um, so in that sense, it, it's simple and it brings, it brings together lots of models together and there's, no, there's very little jargon, um, very easy to pick up, very easy to understand. And so in that way, we think it's quite innovative. There was some research done by Forbes a, a, a while ago and they, as far as business transformation is concerned, to get back to that, they found that 41% of business transformation programs were having difficulties because of um, inefficient execution within. And 35% and were having difficulty because of budget constraints. And so that was a, a piece of some information that they gleaned from business transformation projects. But in the same piece of research, they, had, they advised as to what, um, what you do to mitigate that. Okay, and what they advised is there needs to be a strategic vision with a strategy and that needs to go down to the um, infrastructure of the organisation. That's the first thing. Second thing, they said they needed buy-in from the board all the way down to the employees and a single vision of delivering that strategy. The third thing was there needs to be timely feedback throughout the whole of the, pro of the program to the senior executives of problems. There's very often, uh, um, within an organization, there's very often a, a positive feedback mechanism up to, the, up to the board. So whenever somebody comes to present to the board, everything's wonderful, right? And then only as the project gets to its critical phases do the people reporting up to the board start have, having to give bad news because they're actually not going to deliver on the time that they said. And the best approach is if you deliver that bad information early in the cycle. So as soon as you find, if in, even in the first cycle you find you've got a problem, the best thing to do, which should be encouraged by the board, the board should be saying, I don't want to know about your successes, tell me your problems because we're in a position to be able to sort those problems out. We're in a position to be able to add resources to the project now in order to guarantee results late, later on. And the fourth thing that they asked for was the data across the whole of the program needs to be consistent. Um, the systems and the processes also needs to be consistent. Now, all of those four factors which I just mentioned, they're all part of organisational health. So the reality of business today suggests that looking after the organisational health can not only help businesses not only going through transformation, but those that aren't as well, right? And it reduces your vulnerability to the, to the things that can happen in the marketplace. OK, the final point which I'd like to raise with you, this is the, the concept that you have a bespoke service that you offer to clients. No one company is the same. So given that, how do you identify the very specific needs that clients have? 
Okay, so it may surprise you to learn that we have a process for this. Um, what we do is, is when we first are introduced to an organisation, we will have a, a kind of um, orientation session where we inform the organisation what the nine P's are, how they work, what to look out for, what forms a healthy organisation. And we also get from them what their vision is, what their values are, where they feel the weaknesses are in that organisation with relation to the nine P's. So we get this flow of information, two-way flow, um, and we then help them to develop their dashboard. So, as I said, we may be starting from scratch or they may have an existing dashboard, but we go through the exercise of that matrix of criticality and of um, the nine P's and using their values and their vision, identify which are the most pressing objectives that they need to meet and monitor um, the progress on. So once they've got their dashboard, they've now got a tool by which they can use to drive the message down through the organisation and to collect information back from the organisation to see how they're progressing against it. Um, we then are able to use the health check if they want us to, where we can interrogate the organisation, various aspects of the organisation, and find out where the strengths and weaknesses are, again to inform the dashboard. And then finally, we can do training with them to help them reduce their weaknesses, to improve their practices where they are deficient and where they need to, you know, their highest priority issues are. We can deliver training to help them understand what best practice is and what it looks like and how to actually achieve it. Deborah Mendes and Larry Jones of GPI Global Process Innovations, thank you so much for joining us and taking us through the workings of your company. Thank you. Thank you so much.